Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace, the only platform worth considering when you're ready to start that next great website. This is the age of creation. Think about it. Everyone on the internet is out there making stuff. We're not just reading blogs anymore. We're writing them. We're not just listening to podcasts. We're making them. What a glorious time to be alive. And when it's time for you to move your next creation from your head to the screen in front of you, that's where Squarespace comes in. It's the perfect web tool to help you fashion the internet into whatever you like. Maybe you're the hands-on type. You've got lots of opinions, lots of ideas about what your site should look like. Well, great news. Squarespace gives you all of the customization options you could ever want. With no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Or maybe you just need something functional, something that works with minimal thought. Well, in that case, use one of their beautiful templates. Easy. And once you're done setting up your website, locking in the name, maybe playing with some of the colors, well, Squarespace got tons of extra features. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, really everything you need, Squarespace have taken and put it in one place so you can just make a website easily. So when you're all ready to get started on your next project, if it involves a website, there's no other right. You should just do it with Squarespace, shouldn't you? Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com slash brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now, today's video. While silly and irreverent, the song Yankee Doodle holds a rather patriotic place in many American arts and is even the official state song of Connecticut. Today the jingle may bring to mind a proud revolutionary spirit, but the song's origins are really anything but. The tune was originally used by British soldiers to mock Americans for being disorganized, disheveled, and as far as the Brits were concerned, inferior. By the end of the American Revolution, however, the song had been repurposed by the burgeoning new country. Here now is the story behind the song Yankee Doodle and the answer to that elusive question, why did Yankee Doodle stick a feather in his cap and call it macaroni? As with a lot of older songs, the tune and music that we today associate with Yankee Doodle was actually written much earlier than the 18th century. The melody may have been heard as early as the 1500s in Holland, with rather nonsensical lyrics about the harvest and farmers receiving their wage in buttermilk. Over the next two centuries, that particular melody bounced around Europe and was reappropriated for various other little jingles, like describing the struggles of English Puritans or used in nursery rhymes. Lucy Lockett lost her pocket, Kitty Fisher found it. Nothing in it, nothing in it, but the binding round it. A rhyme that may or may not have been written before the tune started being used for Yankee Doodle. Another theory is that the Hessians were the ones who originally brought the tune to the colonies from Germany, where it was being used in a drinking song. Incidentally, the tune for the Star Spangled Banner was also originally used in a popular drinking song. Much like the origin of the melody, where the well-known lyrics came from is also not definitively known. One popular theory is that similar lyrics were first used to make fun of Oliver Cromwell, the 17th century English political and military leader, for fancying himself a fashionable person. The purported lyrics are sometimes said to have begun as such. Yankee Doodle come to town upon a Kentish pony. However, this seems unlikely, considering the word Yankee didn't come along until years after Cromwell, with the first known documented instance appearing in 1683, used by Dutch settlers in New Amsterdam, today's New York, to disparage their English colonist neighbors in Connecticut. Stemming from the Dutch Yanka, meaning Little John, Yankee was definitely intended as a belittling remark, and became the European way to describe all American colonists, more or less being the equivalent of calling someone a country bumpkin, a redneck, or a dumb hick today. Jaywalker is another term that originally had derogatory connotations deriving from the insult J, meaning more or less a dumb hillbilly. The first known documented instance of the tune and the words Yankee and Doodle Dandy being put together in the same song, it seems, was around the 1750s during the French and Indian War. Prior to fighting for their independence against the British, the colonists were, of course, subjects of the English. Therefore, when the French and Brits went to war over territories in the New World in 1753, the colonists were recruited to join in on the English side. Legend has it, whether true or not is anybody's guess, as no known hard direct documented evidence has survived supporting this oft told story, the British army surgeon named Dr. Richard Schuckberg, who is known to have existed, saw the colonist recruits amble up to join the regular soldiers. Compared to the well assembled and well manicured English army, the colonists were a mess, wearing fashions that hadn't been seen in England in a hundred years, and holding every weapon except those familiar to the fresh, well 
well-drilled British troops. Dr. Schuckberg couldn't help but laugh and write a song. While not exactly the song we've come to know, the song that supposedly inspired Yankee Doodle, whether actually written by Dr. Schuckberg or not, went as such. <laughs> Brother Ephraim sold his cow and bought him a commission And then he went to Canada to fight for the nation But when Ephraim he came home he proved an arrant coward He wouldn't fight the Frenchman there for fear of being devoured Sheep's head and vinegar, buttermilk and tansy Boston is a Yankee town, sing hey doodle dandy The original sheet music for this noted that the song should be sung through the nose and in the West Country drawl and dialect. In other words, it was meant to not only be mocking in lyrics, but also tone. As for Brother Ephraim, this is thought to refer to Colonel Ephraim Williams of the Massachusetts Militia, who ultimately was killed at the Battle of Lake George during the French and Indian War. And if you've ever wondered, we'll be getting to why Colonel is pronounced Colonel in the bonus facts in just a little bit. You're welcome. Upon Completing the lyrics, purportedly, Dr. Schuckberg gave it over to the Continental Marching Band, who played it amid shouts of laughter in the English ranks. Whoever really wrote it, by 1768, the Boston Journal of the Times noted that the British were playing that Yankee Doodle song, though the Times didn't elaborate on what the lyrics were to this version. At this point, the song was constantly being remixed with slightly different lyrics, tunes, and meanings, as was common for pretty much all popular songs at the time. What united many of the earliest versions of this song was the not-so-subtle mocking of colonists as nothing more than moronic, unsophisticated country yokels. For instance, after George Washington was made commander of the rebel army, some unknown individual wrote the following lyrics. Then Congress sent Great Washington all clothed in parrot breeches to meet old Britain's warlike sons and make some rebel speeches. Yankee Doodle came to town for to buy a firelock. We will tar and feather him, and so we will John Hancock. A slightly more familiar version to those of us today is also one of the earlier known versions, generally credited to Harvard sophomore and American Minuteman Edward Bangs. Father, I went down to camp along with Captain Goody. There we saw the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. Continuing to turn the lyrics around, with the colonists variously either taking pride in the song and or directly mocking the British, we have lyrics like Yankee Doodle is the tune that we all delight in. It suits for feasts, it suits for fun, and just as well for fighting. Historians aren't completely sure when the verse about sticking a feather in his hat and calling it macaroni came to be. The oldest known print version of this didn't appear until all the way in 1842, published in London in the book The Nursery Rhymes of England by James Orchard Hallowell, though this particular lyric is obviously thought to date back to the American Revolution, partially due to the term being used here, which dates it somewhat, and how mocking the use of it was. Stepping back a little to a term related to macaroni, there's an interesting side tale about the evolution of the word doodle to one that's more used today. Dude. According to esteemed etymologist Barry Popick and Gerald Cohen, dude was first used in the 1880s as a way to describe young New York City men who had an affinity for being flamboyantly well-dressed, well-manicured, and overly pretentious. In other words, a dandy. You can see our video, The King of the Dudes, for more on this. Using the very words that were used to mock colonists 100 years earlier, doodle dandy, people started to call these 19th century men that as well, as a means to essentially call them pretentious fools. Later, this got short into doodles and then to dudes. Eventually, the spelling was changed to dude, D-U-D-E, instead of D-O-O-D-E-S. And if you're curious, the original female equivalent for this was a dudeen. Fun fact. 
And now back to the term macaroni. This term pertains to the habit of rich 18th century English men going on so-called grand tours, sort of like the more modern gap year. Young adult men who could afford it would take long trips around Europe, learning about culture, art, and the history of neighboring countries. Particularly those from new money would sometimes come back with more refined tastes, like an appreciation of French art, fancy exotic clothes, and Italian food. These individuals, as often over-the-top attempts at trying to appear refined upon their Turn, speaking a mix of Latin and English and wearing foppish attire complete with massive macaroni wigs and not one but two pocket watches were occasionally mocked for this. One of the nicknames they were given at the time was macaronis. The individuals were also considered to be part of the informal macaroni club and would refer to flamboyant fashion and the like as very macaroni. As for the origin of the term itself, it is presumed to originally derive from the fact that macaroni was a relatively exotic food for the British and must have been something at least some some of these individuals raved about upon their return to England. The Oxford Magazine described the so-called Macaroni Club members in 1770 as follows, There is indeed a kind of animal, neither male nor female, a thing of the neuter gender, lately started up among us. It is called a macaroni. It talks without meaning. It smiles without pleasantry. It eats without appetite. It rides without exercise. It wenches without passion. In other words, when the particular lyric stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni were added to the Yankee Doodle song, the author was essentially saying that colonists were such low-class moronic fools that they thought by sticking a simple feather in their hat they were being extremely refined and fashionable. In the end, there were possibly even hundreds of versions of Yankee Doodle in popular circulation during the American Revolution, some initially used by the British to mock their rebellious subjects. In turn, the Americans embraced the song, creating countless versions of their own, and other times simply taking pride in the lyrics which were supposed to be mocking. And that brings us to October the 19th, 1781, when General Cornwallis formally surrendered to American and French forces at Yorktown, Virginia. Legend has it that, as a way to mock the defeated troops, famed French commander and hero of the American Revolution, Marquis de Lafayette, ordered the band to play Yankee Doodle with the victorious soldiers singing along. And now for some bonus facts. While it's often said that the Declaration of Independence was signed on the 4th of July, 1776, this is actually incorrect. In fact, nobody signed it on the 4th. This is contradictory to Thomas Jefferson's, John Adams's, and Benjamin Franklin's accounts of events. On top of their accounts, the public congressional record of events back their story. So how do we know that it didn't happen this way? To begin with, the secret journals of Congress that were eventually made public in 1821 paint a rather different story. They contain an entry stating on August the 2nd, the Declaration of Independence being engrossed and compared at the table was signed by the members. Now, if this was the only evidence, one might lean toward a typo in the journal and believing the aforementioned three individuals and public congressional record. However, one of the other signers of the declaration, Thomas McKean, denied the July 4th signing date and backed it up by illustrating a glaring flaw in Jefferson's, Adams, and Franklin's argument, namely that most of the signers were not members of Congress on July the 4th and thus wouldn't be there to sign it. As McKean said in 1796, no person signed it on that day, nor for many days after. Further evidence comes from the interesting fact that the parchment version of the Declaration of Independence that is on display and kept in the United States National Archives wasn't actually written until July 19th, this being a copy of the approved text that was announced to the world on the 4th of July, with about 150 to 200 copies being made on paper and distributed on that date, 26 of which are still around today, thus predating what is now generally thought of by most as the original. This little tidbit also came from the Secret Journals of Congress, which also has an entry on July the 19th, stating, Resolved that the declaration passed on the 4th be fairly engrossed on parchment with the title and style of the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, and the, the same when engrossed be signed by every member of Congress. So in the end, this signed document probably would have been copied by Timothy Matlock, Jefferson's clerk, rather than penned by Jefferson himself, and certainly couldn't have been signed on the 4th. It's also interesting to note that John Adams thought that July the 2nd, not July the 4th, would be celebrated in the future in the United States. On July the 3rd, 1776, in a letter to his wife, Abigail Adams, he noted, The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. Festival. It ought to be commemorated as the Day of Deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. 
So why did he think the 2nd of July would be Independence Day, and how did the 4th end up getting the nod instead? Well, that's because the 2nd of July is when the Second Continental Congress voted to approve a resolution of independence. Although nobody voted on or signed the Declaration of Independence on July the 4th, that was the date the Declaration was announced to the world and why it was ultimately chosen as Independence Day. And now for another bonus fact. Ever wonder why Colonel is pronounced like Colonel, but K-R-N-E-L? Well, want to know more. Believe it or not, Colonel, like the military rank was pronounced more or less the way it originally looked when it was introduced to English. The spelling changed over time to the modern current spelling of military colonel, while the pronunciation stayed the same as it was before. Colonel ultimately derives from the Latin columna, meaning pillar. This gave rise to the old Italian compagnia colonella, meaning little column company. This in turn gave us the rank of colonello, the leader of a column. Other nations adopted this ranking, giving us the middle French coronel. This was pronounced pretty much like it looks at first, but later slowly down to Colonel by the English, but using the same spelling. However, starting with the French in the 1540s, the spelling was changed back closer to the Italian spelling, which gave us Colonel with a modern spelling in French. The English followed suit, and by the mid 17th century, the modern spelling of Colonel was the most common way to spell the word in English. At that time, the common pronunciation was mixed between the older Colonel and the new Colonel, with the former winning out in the end, despite the way it's spelled.